Welcome to Lecture 6 of Biology 116 entitled Unicont Diversity 3. In this final lecture on the unicons, we're going to be concluding our discussion of the great diversity that we see throughout the animal kingdom. As we've established in the, towards the end of our last lecture, the animal kingdom is incredibly diverse. It's incredibly successful. It's incredibly unique for all of those reasons that we mentioned. In this lecture, we're going to specifically start putting some names to faces. We're going to be looking at some big phyla, smaller clades, smaller groups, and really establishing what it means to be an animal on planet Earth, where you are classified specifically. Now, this lecture is devo uh, really divided into two sort of parts, the idea that we have invertebrates and vertebrates, very broadly speaking. And in order to begin, we're going to just first start a, a very small flowchart on the top here, just devoted to invertebrates just so that we're clear what we mean when we say a term like invertebrates. Invertebrates are simply going to be classified as animals that lack a backbone. So let's write that down. Animals that lack a backbone, as opposed to those who are vertebrates. So we are invertebrates if we lack a backbone, and of course if we are an animal. So we have to focus on that as well. Um, the great thing about invertebrates is the fact that they actually occupy the majority of animal species. They are very, very common. Greater than 95% of animal species, of all animal species, that is, so we're going to do S double P because we're talking about many species, are within this uh, group of organisms, large group of organisms. Um, it's very uh, polyphyletic, as we'll see. In addition, the invertebrates, just like I sort of mentioned right now, they are found throughout the animal phylogenetic tree. So let's write that down as found throughout animal phylogenetic. And let's remember phylogeny, phylogenetic. When we talk about these terms, this simply means evolutionary history. Animal phylogenetic tree. If we take a look at figure 33.2, you will very clearly see this as laid out on uh, the phylogenetic tree of animals. Now, in order to really understand invertebrates, we're going to go through almost all of them from this lecture. Uh, just as a point of reminder, uh, once we're done with this part of this lecture, the invertebrates, take a look at page 710 of the textbook. Um, it's an entire review of chapter 33. A chapter 33 review will really help us summarize everything that we're going to talk about the invertebrates. So these are three basic facts to remember about invertebrates as we talk about them from this point forward. So now I'm just going to make sort of a, a dividing line here since I've gotten this out of the way and begin talking about our first invertebrate. Um, uh, basically we've talked about these guys before and this the next let's say secondary flowchart will be about the phylum periphera. And we've mentioned periphera before. We know that periphera are, of course, sponges, very simple animals, the simplest of all animals, but they still are animals, okay? And they still have some sort of special characteristics for that reason. Let's look at them. In the phylum periphera, let's first establish some basic structure. We've gone very briefly over the periphera structure, basically said that they don't have true tissues or organs, but they do have a certain structure that allows them to have some sort of animal-like specialization, as we'll see. First and foremost, in terms of the structure, I think it's important to remember that these are the least complex of all animals. They are the simplest of all animals, in other words. Least complex of all animals. And we established why in our previous lecture. But the thing I want you to remember is that these animals, they are animals. They are thus still multicellular. Remember one of the rules of being an animal, one of the special characteristics that animals have is that all of them are multicellular. Sponges are no different. They are multicellular, and because they're multicellular, they will possess some very specialized cells. That was another key characteristic that all animals have, specialization, differentiation, specific capabilities, and the sponge is no different to that. But let's remember, though we have these specialized cells, there are no true tissues or organs within this phyla. No true tissues, let me rewrite that, no true tissues slash organs. And because of that, we classify phylum periphera within the metazoans, as opposed to 
the eumetazoans, those with true tissue and organs. So the thing I want you to remember is that peripheral still are somewhat special. Though they're so simple and the least complex, they have these specialized cells. Let's take a look at a typical simple sponge to really identify what it means for these specialized cells within the phylum peripheral. So I'm going to write down typical simple sponge, which you'll see is not so simple. Now, first and foremost, uh, in terms of their body structure, they have a, a sac-like body. Just basic idea how they look. They also contain a structure known as an osculum. And we'll get into this idea a little bit later. And they also have what I think is most important to remember about the sponges, something known as a spongo seal. What did we say a seal was in our previous lecture? This is just a cavity, right? And this is a sponge cavity specifically. That's the name spongo seal. The basic premise behind this is that the spongo seal is a great passage for H2O. It's a great passage for water because these are aquatic animals. They need to live in the water. Um, and we also understand that because it's, it's, it has that seal ending, it's of course a cavity. This cavity is going to be quite central. Okay, It's going to be a central cavity for the passage of water through this sponge. Now, why would you want water to pass through a sponge? Well, first and foremost, I want you to understand one thing. This is not what you think would uh, a cavity usually is, at least in animal uh, structure. Usually a cavity would represent a digestive region in which digestion will happen, like our alimentary canal or our uh, digestive cavity, right? We have a digestive cavity that does digestion. Not the case in sponges. Hold on uh, with one second about that idea because we have to first establish that it's not a digestive canal, okay? So it's not a digestive cavity actually, specifically then what is it? What is this cavity's purpose? The actual idea behind this cavity is based on the idea that sponges are actually, so sponges are actually equal to something known as filter feeders. They do not undergo digestion in the same way that most animals do because they don't have a digestive system. They don't have true tissues or organs to do that type of fancy uh, ingestion and digestion. What they can do is filter things. And filter feeders are exactly what you think they are. All they do is filter food particles through their environment. So let's write this down as filter food particles. And those food particles are going to be within this water environment that they live in. So we'll just say from environment. So if you have some water around you, you have a central canal, central cavity, excuse me, and once you push that water in through that central cavity, you'll filter out food particles, and that's how you obtain your nutrition. Remember, animals are heterotrophic. Sponges are no exception to that rule. They are exception to the rule of true tissues and organs, but they do have to get their food from somewhere, thus their heterotrophic nature, thus their filter feeding strategy. Finally, last thing about sponges, and this is the idea of specialized cells that it's very important to remember, the sponge seal, um, we can also say that within this area we have something known, we have some things known as coanocytes. Coanocytes. This is uh, going to be well established in figure 32.3. And this is actually the previous uh, chapter, not actually chapter 33, but the reason we use figure 32.3 is because the coanocytes look very, very similar to our last universal common ancestor that all animals came from, that coanoflagellate. That coanoflagellate, that ancestral flagellated protist, and the coanocytes look very similar, and it makes sense because periphera are the simplest of animals, and they are closely related to the oldest universal common ancestor known as the coanoflagellate. Take at figure, take a look at figure 32.3 to really drive home that point. So what is a coanocyte? These are the specialized cells that I mentioned. They are flagellated cells, first of all. So they have a flagella, just like that ancestral protist did. They are found on a collar of microvilli. So in order for a sponge to do what it does best, which is filter feed, it has to have these finger-like extensions, very small finger-like extensions, known as microvilli. Those microvilli within them will have these coanocyte structures that you'll see in the figure as well. In addition, the coanocytes are necessarily going to be there for the fact that they line the spongoceal cavity. So the cavity, that central cavity used for water passage, is going to be lined by coanocytes, line spongoceal cavity. And because of this, 
they're going to be very, very useful in the following process. Covanocytes are very, very good at ingesting food. They're very good at taking in food, specifically things like they ingest bacteria plus other tiny food particles, let's say, just like we mentioned before, uh, tiny food uh, particles. So that's their mechanism. That's their specific specialization. That's why we still consider them animals. But of course, they are part of the invertebrate group of animals. Okay, um, They are very simple animals. They have all of these characteristics to remember. I would definitely focus on the fact that they're filter feeders. How do they filter feed? Well, they utilize the sponge seal that has this coanocyte structure, these cells, uh, all around the sponge seal that really are good at ingesting things that surround it because they have these finger-like extensions as you'll see in the figure. Chapter 33 also has a figure, I think it's 33.3 or 4, one or the other, um, that really shows the coanocytes well. So that covers our first and simplest animal and we're only going to get more complex from here. Uh, and in the next couple of videos we'll continue talking about invertebrates and establish a little bit more complexity um, in the animal kingdom based off of different key characteristics.